Good evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back to La Live. My name is Faraz Patel. We'd like to thank you, the viewer, for staying with us. I'd also like to thank my colleague Lukman Shadrak for taking you through that first part of the show. Now, the 193-member United Nations General Assembly yesterday voted overwhelmingly in favor of a resolution calling for a humanitarian ceasefire in Owato and Gaza. Last night's resolution passed with 153 countries voting in favor, 23 abstaining, and 10 countries voting against, including Israel and the United States of America. Now, with the decision not being as binding, the question is how much does this push towards there being that ceasefire? Joining me now to discuss this, I'd like to welcome the University of Johannesburg's politics and international relations lecturer, Nzalama Matebula. Nzalama, good day. Thank you so much for joining us here on Hila Live. Good day. Uh, thank you for having me. Okay, Nzalama, before we talk about what happened uh, yesterday during that uh, General Assembly uh, meeting, I, I, I want to turn your attention to the, the comments made by Joe Biden, the U.S. president, when he said, and I quote, uh, you are losing support. This was a, a, a quote he referenced to Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister. I mean, where did that come from? Nobody really expected a comment like that to occur, but it happened. Uh, so what I can say is um, the prime minister of Israel never had any support uh, to begin with. Uh, what it had, it was an alliance with the superpower, which would then uh, be very much, uh, very dense in helping it um, have a very heavy stance and um, having it uh, actually shape the outcomes of the war. What he was actually saying is that the USA might just actually change stances and he might lose the USA's power as a superpower. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of pressure coming from the United States of America. Uh, of course, you know, they, they as a country have a lot of problems in terms of health issues, in terms of social issues that are happening within that country. So one has to look at it from an, a, an internal point of view where the American public is saying, listen, yeah, President Biden, you can't be taking our money and funding wars, for example, what the Israelis are doing in Gaza, and also when we go to the eastern part of Europe, the Ukrainian and Russia conflict. Most definitely. So what is happening is you have internal pressure, mostly because next year there are elections. That's the reason why you have so much internal pressure. So what you find is the office of the president uh, tends to be very wary of how their decisions actually wrap off on the rest of the society and most definitely voters. So uh, they wouldn't want to have a bad taste or actually have um, a, an unpleasant impact on their voters for next year's elections. So that's the reason why he heeds the call, whereby uh, he, he warns uh, the prime minister of Israel. So he never really had uh, support to begin with. He was only supported by superpowers. So that's the reason why uh, he has so much impact. Yeah, interesting to see what happens there because, of course, Donald Trump is waiting in the ranks should he be allowed to go in and actually contest that election. Okay, Salama, let's go to uh, what happened y yesterday at the General Assembly. Of course, it was brought by uh, Egypt and Mauritania for this, mm -hmm. uh, for this, for this General Assembly meeting. What was interesting, I mean, you could see the amount of countries that really came through, 153 countries. So that is quite huge, isn't it? Meaning that there, there is a strong worldwide call for there to be that immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. And the 153 countries is a testament to that. Most definitely, most definitely. But unfortunately, due to how the United uh, Nations uh, Security Council is shaped, when you have one um, superpower, a veto power actually voting against, then it, it just nullifies the whole resolution. Uh, that's the reason why it was termed the symbolic, um, a symbolic non-binding uh, resolution, <laughs> which I quite do not understand, because what you find is it, the war is not prosecutable. Itself, you know, it does not really enact a law into place for there to be a ceasefire. But what they are rather creating, uh, they are trying to be these uh, norm entrepreneurs uh, that ones that actually pioneer towards uh, stigmatizing wars. So they are trying to create a culture that actually looks down on wars. But that is not enough, of course, considering that a war doesn't stop and people get killed every day. And Zalama, you mentioned it's not binding, and I think that's obviously 
you know, the two words that I've been mentioned after what happened last night. But surely there has to be a way forward. Uh, maybe can you give us an idea of what can happen next? Because it's clear there's a worldwide call for there to be a humanitarian ceasefire and the numbers uh, don't lie. What happens next? What can happen in order for the ceasefire to be executed immediately? Uh, so what would happen is we would start with uh, the, the, the Biden administration actually voting against Israel because it's a veto power. So that would actually put more weight on uh, the United Nations Security Council resolution to actually for it not to be nullified, for it to be binding, and for that to, to come some convention or a declaration. So what usually happens is international law itself is usually curated and configured by events. So what would happen then, considering the longevity of the war, we would then need a declaration in place that would just present something like this going further. So then it would need a lot and a lot of support actually uh, weighing on the side of Gaza for, for there to be a resolution, a declaration or a convention uh, that can actually ensure that um, this may never happen again. And, and there lies the problem. Uh, you mentioned, of course, the Biden administration and the U.S. having so much of that sway within the Security Council. Um, <laughs> There was worldwide condemnation last week, Friday, of course, when they vetoed. And of course, given the Island Security Council, they have that ability to go ahead and veto any decision. Um, the world is hoping that this can change in order for there to be a stop to this war. But uh, should we expect anything less from the USA, given that they've done this before? So what's stopping them from going ahead and vetoing it again? Uh, we can only hope for uh, President Biden and his administration to actually consider the 2024 elections. Uh, that would very much end the criticism uh, worldwide. I do believe that the comment that he actually ushered towards the uh, Prime Minister of Israel was due to the criticism that came throughout the world due to them actually voting against the resolution. So that alone, uh, that normative system and culture that we're trying, the United Nations is trying to create, uh, would then uh, have to um, actually do more. But in honestly speaking, I would say that the United Nations Security Council structure itself, the architecture has to be changed. Mm -hmm. Because what you find is you have a concentration in a number of selected countries, which are five, and they have such good heavy veto power. So then this unipolar system has to change. And yeah, I, I would consider that to be a very resolutive uh, strategy going forward. So the United Nations Security Council structure and architecture has to change first in order for there to be a bilateral or multilateral system that can enable for um, uh, the resolution to be, uh, to be heard by many of the countries, irrespective of uh, how big your economy is, or how big and good your military is. Yeah, and that is, of course, the big question. You know, we've got the United Nations, and the Security Council brings in sort of like the animal farm theory that, listen, we are above you, and there's nothing you can do, so you can make all of these decisions, but come the Security Council, we will have that final say. And there lies the issue, isn't it, that, look, this has to be some sort of reform within the United Nations, because... In a situation like this, where we have, have this war in Gaza, which has gone for over two months, I mean, if the reforms are there, I mean, this, this assault on Gaza could have ended two or three weeks ago. But unfortunately, those reforms are just not being put in place. Yes, most definitely. And this actually goes back to the BRICS order, what is being termed the BRICS order. So many of the countries are now seeing an alternative uh, that doesn't necessarily subjugate them or actually make them feel less of countries and compromise their sovereignty within the BRICS order itself because uh, they can actually accomplish their national interests, international uh, corporations and foreign policy without being uh, subjugated. So what you find is that's the reason why you have an alternative of the BRICS order. The world is changing uh, rapidly and drastically to actually address such challenges. So the BRICS order itself is as a consequence of such unipolar systems and the concentration of power on superpowers within the United Nations Security Council, because it's, 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 it's quite unpleasant to have 
a, an international relations institution that does not necessarily have an umbrella approach and is very much biased.